Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where it is that you're uh, joining us. It is my pleasure and privilege uh, to be in a conversation with my dear old friend and esteemed colleague, Professor Shahla Hairi, who is uh, a remarkable uh, scholar and remarkable advocate for uh, Iranian uh, women. Uh, and this is fortunately not the first time that we have had the good fortune of uh, hosting her at Stanford. Uh, the occasion for um, uh, this conversation is, as uh, Ms. Parhad indicated, the continuing discussion about women's movement in Iran. Uh, uh, Professor Hayri's latest work uh, does not cover Iran specifically, but because of her uh, long interest and writing on Iran, invariably that comes up. Uh, her book before was specifically on a phenomena that is almost unique to Iran, uh, the issue of temporary marriages. So as a first question, I want to, uh, first of all, congratulate her for the book, but also ask how she went from writing about Iran. I know her work is unique in its cross-cultural uh, aspect. How did she went from Iran and the issue of temporary marriage, the controversial issue of temporary marriage, to writing about the uh, unforgettable queens of uh, Islam. Uh, salam. Um, so thank you um, very much, um, Professor Milani, and I'd like to thank your um, Ms. Bahad and uh, Franco for helping me uh, all along uh, to get into this stage. Um, well, you know, uh, I think um, I did my um, uh, first book, uh, uh, Law of Desire, um, when I was a graduate student uh, at UCLA. And um, as, 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 a, as, a, as a young um, graduate student, I was looking for something unique, something uh, ethnographically interesting, and nobody had ever done any work on an institution of temporary marriage. And when I started thinking about it, it was actually before revolution of 1979. So it was something that um, I thought I could just do and, you know, uh, go back to Iran and um, uh, and uh, interview uh, women who had actually done that and to find out why was it that they did that and what were their justifications for this form of marriage in a country where we do have, uh, you know, men have the permission to have several wives. So what was the justification? So I was both uh, interested in law and how law uh, is translated into practice who are the lawmakers, who are the practitioners of this form of marriage. Um, but what I also found out is that uh, it's actually, even though in this form it's unique to Iran, in a sense, it is something really um, uh, Islamic, it, almost all over the Muslim world. One form or another of this form of marriage is practiced, although it may not be necessarily called temporary marriage or sire as, uh, Iranian called, you know, call it in the Iranian vernacular is known as Sire or Mut'e, which is its technical term. So in a way, it is also uh, across cultures uh, in the Islamic world because they have to deal with this issue of um, how to allow for people to practice certain, uh, to, 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 to have relationship outside of the the one that is um, approved by the state, right? So not everybody can do that. And of course, marriage moves along a certain uh, perspective, perspective, but not everybody can do it. So by itself, it's really not a problem because people can decide whether they want to be married temporarily or permanently. The problem is in the extreme unequal um, status, responsibilities, duties, uh, privileges of men and women. Men can have four wives simultaneously and as many temporary wives as they like. In the old days, they could have as many concubines as they want. They could have slave women. So this is a tremendous difference between the status or what women can expect to have as a citizens. Often they are not considered a full citizen. They move something between citizen and, and subject and what men can have. So what was interesting for me to not only retrieve the history of this tradition in the Muslim world, in Islamic history, but find out how it, it gets to practice in Iran. And then later on, I discovered that it is actually done in almost all over the, the, the Muslim world. 
So would you like me to then and that? Well, well, Absolutely. Okay. So what it is, what was interesting for me um, after I finished that book, which was well received, and um, um, really uh, it, it initiated a lot more studies that used that book as as the you know foundation for later studies. But look, we live in this country. I live in America. I teach. And I'm constantly in touch with the students, with the scholars, with friends, both Americans or from other cultures or Iranians. We do see the kinds of narrative that is dominant in this country as far as women are concerned. Even when I did my, well, that narrative is something, you know, odd Muslim women, which has come to be known as a colonial narrative, which assumes that Muslim women are this huge undifferentiated category, regardless of their ethnicities, nationalities, class, education, profession, what have you. Um, so as I uh, talked about my first book, I actually tried to bring out women's agencies, even though women are disadvantaged, true, uh, hugely. In, uh, in Iran, nonetheless, they're not without options. And those that are a bit smarter that try to use their options. But then again, coming back to this narrative, this um, colonial narrative about women, it occurred to me in the 1990s that it seemed as if I, as an educated Muslim woman, were totally invisible to the educate, even the educated, let alone the, uh, the, the general public, to the scholarly community, to my students. So I thought that um, I need to um, bring out uh, other dimensions of Muslim women's lives. And in that sense, it didn't really matter whether you were Iranians or Pakistanis or, uh, from other, or Egyptians, other parts of, parts of the Muslim world. So my idea was to, uh, to make visible, shall we use that, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, expression, um, the um, lives and uh, activities of women, educated, uh, professional, middle class, upper middle class Muslim women. And up to that, uh, up until then, pretty much like my book on temporary marriage, nobody really had paid much attention to edu educated professional Muslim women. Most of the studies were obsessed with the idea of veiling. Veiling is important. We have to understand it in context. We have to understand its history. We have to understand how women have historically engaged with it. But it's also important to understand there are other categories of Muslim women all over the Muslim world. As I mentioned, even in Iran, even these women, um, those who practice temporary marriage, who are from underprivileged uh, classes for the most part, they, they engage with the structures of power. They wanted to have a meaningful relationship. So I wanted to, for my second book, to again um, have some comparative basis for the studies we do. And also my interlocutors are Americans here, my students, my colleagues, people who read these books. So that took me to Pakistan. And I have to tell you, even as a, as, as a Muslim educated woman, the first time I went there, I, I was surprised at my own stereotypes that were still pretty much colored by what I had heard in this country, even though I was trying to challenge those and engage with those. So I went to Pakistan, I was quite impressed by the category of professional, educated, middle-class, upper middle-class women, how these women engage with their own communities, how they are trying to be of some uh, you know, use of some help to their own communities, to their families, to their societies, to their communities. So that book was, again, trying to give a comparative perspective. Because particularly, <laughs> I have to say, when we come to Iranians, I realize that we really are so focused on our own culture. And obviously, we have such a tremendous history. We have a civilization of which we can be rightly proud of. But at the same time, I think we need to get out of our own cultures, to look at other people, to look at other examples in the Muslim world, to truly understand the history of Islamic development, not just Iran, um, which of course, as I said, has a very proud history, but also the other Muslim, uh, Islamic country. Which brings me to my last um, book. And actually that book was initially I was initially inspired by Iranian women 
who at the turn of the 21st century nominated themselves, some women nominated themselves for the office of the president in a country like Iran, in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Here I was in America waiting to, you know, see some articles in New York Times about that Washington Post, not a peep. Nobody talked about that, not even in Iran, you know, and, uh, except for Majale Zanon, you know, the, and, and others who talked a little bit about that. So I just wanted to know who are these women? What do they think about themselves? What do they think about their societies? What kind of discourse do they use? How aware are they of the society in which they live? The constitution of a country in which they were challenging, you know, so that created the impetus for me to look at the whole idea of leadership of women, which then brought me to the idea of the significance of women in general, Muslim women in particular, and of course, when we come to Iranian women, to have a seat at the political table, because it is there when they can influence the change. They can suggest different ways of understanding gender relationship. They can suggest and be influential in creating a law that is more equitable, that is more friendly, understanding, uh, egalitarian of the hugely uh, unequal or injustices that have been, that have, you know, women have felt throughout Islamic history. So that's how, that's the trajectory of my work. Uh, let me make one comment. I, I'm very surprised uh, that you identify yourself as a Muslim uh, woman. Uh, I've always thought of you as Shahari. Uh, if I thought, uh, furthermore, I would have thought of an uh, eminent Iranian scholar who's working in America. The fact that you identify yourself as a Muslim woman for me is very indicative of uh, where are you trying to stay in this whole narrative, uh, which is, you know, fascinating uh, to look at. And the second comment is uh, when you talk about the candidates for presidency in Iran uh, as a novelty, uh, I'm sure you know better than I do, Iran is a culture that has had queens, kings. Sure. Sure. Uh, and, uh, in the modern history, 150 years ago, we had Oratul Ain, uh, we had uh, a minister who is, I'm sure, your friend. Uh, uh, we had her on our program, uh, Afghami, uh, Farouk Parsa was a minister. Uh, so uh, the fact that the Islamic Republic for 20, 30 years blocked every access of women to political power and then blocked them from accessing a presidency doesn't give uh, them uh, a privileged position as Muslim women seeking authority. I would have thought you would talk about this as how in spite of the effort of this Islamic state to block every political effort by women, some women are still trying, even within this limited concept that says Rajal can run and Rajal historically has meant men. Occasionally, Khadimut Talagani said, who said Rajal is men? Okay, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, uh, how would you, uh, I mean, how does one reconcile these different uh, identities and try to you know, stay in a place that you don't fall into, as you call the colonial discourse, but you don't also fall into this other narrative that tries to legitimize Islam. Muslim women, well, I have, I'll come back and tell you why I considered myself a Muslim, and I don't make any apologies about that, because I think Muslim women have historically shown how much they have been involved in their uh, communities in the societies and how much they have tried to change the, the narratives of, um, you know, victimized Muslim women, which it is, you know, the misogyny that is gone to women back in, in Iran or any other Arab, Arab Muslim com uh, communities. It's not, it's not uh, um, a secret. We, we see it all the time. We feel it, you know. No, the, the reason I say Muslim uh, women I mean, Islam provides um, a, a, a multiplicity of identity that identities that you can you can actually, uh, in a way, you can pick and choose. I mean, you know, at the turn of the century, uh, um, Islam, you know, you have all these magnificent women: Khadija, Aisha, Zainab, Fatima. 
But in fact, in my book on uh, Queen of um, Unforgettable Queens of Islam, I start with the significance of uh, leadership of uh, Empress Purandot in Iran for the later development of misogyny that has now been perpetrated on um, women in the Muslim world and specifically in Iran. So I, in fact, I have made a point of talking about her and having um, not exactly a chapter because it was not about Iranian uh, kings uh, and queens, but she has a place of honor there. Absolutely, that is very important and no doubt we should not forget that. Furthermore, um, in my book, I talk about that I'm talking about women on, in, you know, uh, uh, at the forefront of the position of power, not behind the scene. Women behind the scene have always had power, and I talk about that in my book. Not only they have had power, they have had power to change regimes, to influence men of power, and to the point that when you read Nizam al mulk you know, talking about, you know, at the time of Malak Shah, he is just so upset about women having so much power in the court of the king, <laughs> and in fact, he is, all the smart, you know, all the intelligence that this man has, he makes the ultimate mistake by telling the, by advising the king to choose another son of his, or a son not of his favorite wife, wife but of someone else. Guess what happened? She manages for the king to kick him out and eventually have him killed. So <laughs> these women have always had powers and um, someone like Orat al Ain is superb, and my beloved friend has written much about her, and every time I use her example, of course, I use um, Fazana Milani's work. So these are facts of life, and I have tried to weave those into my book, because uh, these women who get to the position of power don't come out of vacuum. There mm -hmm. is uh, um, a huge amount of a uh, number of women behind it. There is a layer of um, exercising power and prestige. But my um, point in that book was specifically women who have worn the crown, shall we say, not those who have, uh, uh, you know, functioned behind the throne. In fact, talking about Iran, I talk, I have devoted not in a few pages, not only to Purandok, our famous emperor, which let me just say that she was the only one among all the men who confronted the Arab invasion. She was the one who actually, who managed to um, win the only battle that has come to be known as the Battle of Bridge. She tried to forgive many of the people's taxes. She tried to uh, create a more equitable uh, society rather than this hugely class difference a differentiated society. Unfortunately, she was killed by one of her leaders. So that's one. But another example I use of Iran, which is superb, it's really amazing, is the daughter, second daughter of Shah Tahmasp of Safavi, Padi Khan Khanum, whose name, interestingly, is called Padi Khan Khanum, has both the Khan and the Khanum in it. And again, she was extraordinary. She was eventually killed by her brother's wife, um, or instigated by her brother before she actually became, you know, before she turned 30. So these women have always had power. And we have them, we have them uh, in, in really remarkable numbers. And we should be proudly, we should be really proud of them. But the reason I said this um, video documentary that I made in the turn of the century is that here we're talking about the Islamic Republic of Iran, which as you rightly said, had done its best to vanquish women and stifle the voices, right? But here then again, we see that women have not, have not remained silent. And this, the categories of women or the number, uh, there are only six women there who I was able to find and interview. But the most important challenge they level against the regime is precisely on that Article 115, which has to do with the qualities of who can or cannot be the president of a country like Iran. And the word there is Rajal. 
So Mrs. Talagani, as you mentioned rightly in 1996, and then later on this other woman said, who said the Rajal should be understood as men? We are Persians. We are Iranians. We do not have these propositions. Rajal in Iran can mean, has meant, um, uh, those political elite. And women are a member of the political elite. And one of the women I interviewed is really just very distinguished lady, tightly veiled. And um, she was the, the uh, uh, discipline, uh, what do you call that, Nazem, you know, like uh, a principal of a high school. She was so astute in her talking about why it is important for women to become leaders, even of a country like the Republic of Iran. First of all, she used as uh, the person who legitimated her leadership was the Queen of Sheba from the uh, revelations that Prophet Muhammad received. So she said, here we have this example of the Queen of Sheba. So why can't I become the president of a country like Iran? But she was astutely aware of the, the, the tenor of the discourse of the Islamic Republic. Everything she said, she used religious and, um, you know, uh, either uh, revelations or traditions, either the ayahs from the Quran or Hadith of Prophet Muhammad. She knew what she was doing, you know, and she said, she clearly talked, she says, I, I disagree with this veil that I have, you know, on my hair. She disagreed with the forced veiling, even though she was veiled. Now, the importance of that film was not just for Iranians, because many disagreed with that and objected to it, because as you said, because of the dynamics, the political dynamics in the country. But here, I also teach young people students here, and I engage with my, my colleagues here, students and my colleagues could see the fact that, first of all, these women have different variations of hijab, different variations of scarf. So they understood that there are differences among them. They understood that this is forced on some people. They also understood that just because these women wear a scarf, they don't lose their brain. They are trying to engage the most sacrosanct political structure in the country and engage with that. So these are all very interconnected uh, um, um, the, you know, with the way that I try to write, because I'm not just writing for Iranians. I've written some Persian or, you know, articles, but I'm writing for a, a, a broader community and, and Muslim and also Americans here in this country. Uh, uh, as a confirmation of the influence that these women had, I think just last week, the representative or the spokesperson for the Guardian Council said that they have reconsidered the word Rajal, and now women are considered Rajal, and they might have a candidate uh, at this coming election. I mean, it's again, part of the political dynamics, they're in a crisis, they know women are angry, and they think a woman might save the regime, but nevertheless, it's a very major uh, shift that has uh, occurred. Uh, if I may say, add something there. Um, uh, in one of the women I interviewed in that video is Shahla Sherkat, who is a very notable, very interesting woman who has been publishing uh, a, a magazine now it's called Zanana Emruz. She makes a very interesting point there, which I wasn't initially aware of, but then, of course, you know, she brought it to my attention. She says that at the time of the Islamic Republic, when the constitution was being written, and Ayatollah Beheshti was there, there was actually a debate as to whether or not that word should be rajal or should be men. And the person who suggested that no, it should be rajal was in fact Ayatollah Beheshti who realized these uh, dead ends at the, you know, in, uh, in, the, in the constitution. So he wanted to leave, to let a way out of such um, dilemmas. Uh, so in a way though, that whole idea was there and these guys, you know, saving face and saying, okay, now women can um, apply for that. But every time they can get disqualified by the guardian council, <laughs> yes, they can go and they can buy some, um, you know, uh, positive points for themselves, but nonetheless, they can go on and uh, disqualified women. Um, 
I'll ask one more question. I can see that there are many people uh, submitting questions that they, we're going to allow people to ask you questions. Uh, so one last question that I wanna ask. Uh, as I indicated earlier, you're one of the few scholars who has studied these Islamic women's movement in a comparative uh, context. Uh, what would you say are the unique characteristics or are there any unique characteristics to the Iranian women's movement contemporary Iranian women's movement as compared to these other countries that you have studied? You know, that's a question that I didn't quite consider in such a way that you have articulated. One of the things that um, I can just quickly think about and talk about is um, self-confidence that many Iranian women have. Uh, which is really very interesting. One of the things, that, again, that I talk about the video that I made, that you know, some people challenged, that particularly men, in fact, challenged me more than women did, was the self-confidence these women showed. You know, I mean, they come from different backgrounds that you do not quite see among, um, well, at least not in my in my uh, studies. You know, I haven't seen. Although I have seen Pakistani women being very, very uh, articulate, very engaged, very involved in their um, communities, but still there is something unique about Iranian women, it seems to me, and that is, as I said, is that sense of why can't I? Why can't I be the leader of a country like Iran? We've had that because we have the models. We have the models. We have the examples in, in our history. And our history is so long, or um, the cultural uh, richness that we have creates s some kind of uh, character, some kind of identity. Uh, you know, and again, I'm just talking quickly uh, without really uh, giving it much thought. But you are right. I have noticed that um, Iranian women, on the whole, that it doesn't matter from what class they are, and that's what's interesting because Pakistani women that I interviewed are from basically upper middle class background. But Iranian women, I have seen, I have, I, I go to Iran frequently, I've talked to so many people, even from very impoverished backgrounds, but these women have a sense about themselves, have an idea about their identity. And that identity is actually Iranian identity, which it is uh, based, it's uh, rested on this long history, this layered and long history of, um, you know, uh, tradition, um, culture, politics. It, it's really something interesting that we can talk about that later on. But in my next project, I'll think more about that now that you brought that to my attention. I, 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 I mean, it is really remarkable how important the role of women have been in the last 40 years. Uh, uh, yes, and if I may just add one last thing, um, I would like again to make a reference to my friend, Farzana Milani, who talks about the third revolution in Iran. The first being the constitutional revolution, second being uh, the revolution of 79. And then this revolution is a lot more amorphous, but it is there. It is continuing and we are beginning to see manifestations of it in all these uh, stratas and classes of Iranian uh, society. Yeah, I think uh, some people might not have read or heard Farzaneh's uh, speech. I mean, Farzaneh, the third revolution is the rise the women's of women's revolution, the entrance of women in the public uh, domain. Uh, right. I think, you know, the prominence of characters like uh, Nationalists today in the Absolutely. democratic struggles of the people of Iran and many, many other. I mean, if you look at the icons of sure. the, yeah. the struggle, uh, how many of them are women right now? It's just remarkable. A majority of them are women. Um, and it is interesting just to see that how many voices of these women are, I mean, what a huge effort is made to stifle these voices, but they are continuing. And, um, um, I, I didn't, one, uh, before I uh, forget, I had one other question. Uh, I, many years ago, I had read a, uh, a book by Mernisi, The Forgotten uh, Queens. Queens of Islam. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how your book, uh, differs from that, whether it uh, was influenced by it in any way? Oh, to begin with, it's very different. But yes, of course, the title, I mean, she was a pioneer and she started talking about these uh, amazing women in history of Islam. Again, she tried to do some comparative work and bringing out all these women. At the time, it was great, still is. Um, but what 
I sort of differed from her was that she thought that they are forgotten by history. But I was trying to say, no, they were not, because not only, well, maybe by history, male history, yes, because uh, our history books are written by men, uh, primarily by men, for men, and, you know. Uh, um, so, but then I was going to say that there is another uh, um, arena, another domain, where women have not been forgotten. This is the public domain. This is the oral history of these women that have remained. And also I was trying to say how pragmatically patriarchy has tried to sort of mold itself to get to accommodate some of these women themselves. So it's not totally that they have been forgotten by history. In fact, because if they had been completely forgotten, we wouldn't be hearing about them over and over again. So I, I was inspired by her title, The Forgotten, but I was going to say they were unforgettable because they are in the history of these countries. And if you go to these countries, if you talk to people, you know, almost the entire public knows something about them. So it's not that they are being forgotten, but no I doubt her work is pioneer. Fantastic. And, so, uh, I know we have questions, so I don't want to uh, monopolize. I can ask you many, many, many other questions that I have. Thank you very much for Thank you. my questions. It was a great now, talk, conversation. Uh, Ms. Roma Parhad is going to ask some of the questions that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hayri. A few questions coming through from our viewers. Um, one viewer asks, what do you think are the biggest obstacles to Muslim women being portrayed in the media for their accomplishments? What do we need to do as a society to increase representation of Muslim women in said media, such as those who you wrote about in your book? Well, again, that's a very good question. And I started by saying that Muslim women, all I mean, I am talking about women in general from the Muslim world, and I don't want to um, imply as if there is a big category of Muslim women. Nonetheless, women from the Muslim world in all these societies seem to be in a, uh, uh, between rock and a hard place because um, many of their own home countries um, provide or, or the way that they treat uh, their women um, give the impression, or, or there's not the impression, they're being quite misogynistic. Um, women don't have much right in terms of uh, the person they want to, uh, well, I mean, at the times of divorce, they may now have a chance to marry to, to the person they want, but as soon as they marry, they lose many of their rights and, and uh, privileges. Uh, they cannot leave the country without their husband's permission. Uh, the way they have been treated by their own um, political and religious organizations back in their home countries provide enough fodder for the way that the Western media then can uh, refer to those and say, look, this is how you are being treated. What the West does pretty much want, what these Islamic countries do is try to unify, is try to uh, remove the multiplicity, the, the diversity, the complexity of women's, the categories of women or the kinds of women who are involved in their communities by just pointing out to um, the women, um, you know, how women are being treated in that part of the world. Um, just imagine, you know, like in Afghanistan, um, women, and in Iran too, uh, in Turkey, in many Muslim countries, women are being um, stoned to death. Uh, even if they were to, uh, to, to, to claim or to have been raped. If women, again, that's what I mean by being between a rock and a hard place. If women were to say they were raped, then they, that would be taken to mean that uh, they have confessed to having um, illegal you know, relationship uh, with men. And then that would be a justification for their um, stoning. Whereas if you look at even at the uh, time of the Prophet Muhammad, um, I mean, of course, there are the Quranic revelations, which goes against such behavior. But nonetheless, men who have been, I mean, the scholars who have interpreted these particular revelations have turned, have twisted the, the idea, uh, the treatment, the very equitable, um, wise treatment Prophet Muhammad had of uh, women who have been accused, meaning particularly his own wife, but you know, in, in, in Iran, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, we, see, we hear that women are being stoned to death. 
which is really a horrible thing to do. So the West, in the Western media, you see that these uh, images of women are taken and then projected as if this is the only way that uh, women uh, um, are being treated or as, the, or as if the only women, the only way that women are behaving in those countries. So the way we can do it is just to talk to people. To, of course, you know, we don't have access to media. Media is very powerful in this nation, in this country, you know. But um, talk, I talk to my students, I show them the slides. I, you know, constantly try to challenge such ideas by bringing specific actions of women from all over the Muslim world. I show a video documentary called Feminism Inshallah, which shows, you know, how women have been uh, uh, challenging the uh, political their political system religious system you know economic system in their own countries and how they try to produce provide a more reasonable pictures of women so i think we just have to constantly bring out the inconsistencies not to be so defensive about what's happening in our part of the world because what's happening in our part of the world is really not defensible but also challenge what's happening in this part of the world Thank you. Another viewer asks, going back to the temporary marriage question, what occurs to children born into these marriages? What if the father denies the child? Are they able to attain a passport, for instance, or driver's license? Referring to the new documentary, Love Child, which follows a complicated love match and their child and its implications, it was part of the inspiration behind this question. Well, okay, let's go one by one. Um, to begin with, uh, legally, um, this a form of marriage, um, a woman's children, child, is considered legal. But that's assuming that she cares to register the marriage, right? If, it is, if the marriage is not registered, then, and the father denies that, then she has no recourse. Of course, now we have the DNA, she can have the DNA. But in the old days, if a father, in fact, I have a case like that in my book. If a man denies a paternity, she has no recourse unless she has had some people witnessing the act of um, you know, the uh, short contract of temporary marriage between the couple. Otherwise, she could actually be um, punished for having, uh, um, uh, had, you know, having uh, performed adultery. So it's important for the woman to realize what they're getting into, right? So register that. So legally, we're told that uh, children of temporary marriage are uh, um, recognized, they inherit uh, uh, equitably uh, the same amount as the children born of regular marriages. Again, these are all with the recognition of the law because they have women have to have the presence of mind and intention to register the marriage and then you know have other people witness that. So witnesses are very very important. So legally, yes, women, uh, uh, you know, um, a child is recognized. And if it is recognized, therefore, the child can have um, passports, um, uh, you know, a international aid, the ID cards, and everything else that goes with that. But that, in reality, doesn't quite happen like that. But this is the law that I was just mentioning. Thank you. Another viewer says, what do you think is the reason behind the very low participation of Iranian women in the economy, even compared to other Muslim countries, in spite of the closure of the educational gap since at least two decades ago? Well, economy is not exactly my area of expertise, but let me just make two points. One is that um, as soon as, in fact, um, Islamic Republic consolidated its power and many women were kicked out of their positions, then they turn into the informal economy. In fact, I've talked to so many people who try to convert their little rooms into um, some kind of office for, for them to uh, uh, perform some kind of economic activities, whether it was selling vegetables or make quilt making or um, um, any other objects. So the informal economy, in fact, flourished. Uh, so I don't know about the, the um, the uh, official, the formal economy. Um, um, again, you know, I don't know the exact number of um, the involvement of women in other uh, Islamic countries, but the problem is that right now Iran has been facing so much, you know, problem that um, the economy is in such shambles that almost nobody really, except for a 
small group of people and nobody really does have much job. But again, this is not really the area that I know of. But what I do want to emphasize is how women tried to uh, maintain their families by doing this informal uh, uh, economic and productive activities. And there's a lot of them. There are a lot of them. Thank you. Another viewer asks, how much do you think the Me Too movement, the photos of women without scarves, the action of feminist activists in Iran is reaching or influencing the great majority of women, rural, lower class, middle women, et cetera? Um, again, I have not really um, specifically pursued that uh, particular uh, um, movement. To begin with, um, Iranian women are uh, from whatever, I mean, the villages, the small towns, the big towns are becoming aware of um, how the political elite or people in power have used the power to manipulate sexually or otherwise a lot of young people. You know, there's a very famous case of Rehane Jabari who was, you know, uh, uh, attacked by her boss, I mean, the man who wanted to hire her, and then she killed him, and then eventually she was killed. So these events happen quite frequently. What is good is that more and more people are becoming aware. I mean, publicity is important. Once women have their voices heard in the public domain, then it is difficult to shut them down, you know. Uh, as uh, one of the women I interviewed several years ago in Iran told me, she said, look, and she was, uh, again, you know, um, from you know, a member of the Mr. Khatami's uh, cabinet, she said, but look, the windows have been opened up. Women are out in the streets. You cannot push them back in the confinement of their homes. So Me Too movement or any movement like that creates a certain awareness and women have become aware, have a work, you know, have awakened to what is happening. And uh, whenever they get a chance, they try to make their voices heard. And what is more important is the, the collective agency of this woman that is becoming more and more powerful. That's what's creating the backlash on the part of the states in Iran or anywhere else. Um, so I am sure that more and more um, women are becoming aware of these situations. But the case of Romina in, in, uh, in uh, the village in northern Iran uh, several months ago really again uh, uh, awakened a lot of people and they just it just can't happen that a father can just go on and kill her little his little daughter just because he doesn't like the man who she wants to be with so they have you know the, the state is confronted with these situations confronted with the idea of women's political leadership confronted with the idea of women um i mean the economy of the family needs women participation needs women to help them so for them for the state not to allow women to participate in the economic sector, it's it's just doesn't make sense. So by the same token, you know, to um, keep trying to um, hide these ideas or hush them or just say that these things aren't happening or they're imported from the West, people are just seeing in their daily lives and they've become more and more aware of it and they cannot be uh, silenced any longer. Thank you. Um, but we have a lot of questions that I want to try to get to before we run out of time. So another viewer writes, your scholarship extends beyond the realm of one country. In view of your cross-cultural work, how do you think women have challenged the dynamics of power structures in Iran? What are their successes and their challenges? Um, well, we all, I mean, um, uh, Dr. Milani talked about the women being in power, you know, in Iran uh, for a long time, and I agree with that, and I have written about them. But let's just look at the, after the revolution of 1979 and see what women have done. Um, women were in the forefront of revolution, right? In fact, uh, one of the women I interviewed uh, in my video documentary, she says, look, in fact, not, not only one woman, three women mentioned that. Um, by all account, women and youth made the revolution possible in Iran. So women were in the public domain, were, were, women were in uh, uh, the forefront of revolution and fighting for their rights. Many wanted to have a more egalitarian society, a more democratic society, and they fought for it. Well, in no time, they were pushed back because of the changes in the political regime. But once women caught their breath, they came back again and they wanted to be involved in politics. Um, 
it, it's just enough for us to look at the sixth parliament. Only Khanum uh, Talagani that Dr. Milani talked about, one of the first women uh, who got into the parliament in Iran. But then the most important period in the history of um, Islamic Republic, as far as women and political participation and awareness is concerned, is the sixth parliament, which I believe it was um, 1996 through 2000 or right about around that time. The women, I mean, you look at six women in that parliament and the kinds of discourse they have is just mind boggling. They are so incredibly aware, powerful, knowledgeable, not only of the discussions and discourse they have within the parliament and they, you know, they force their uh, uh, colleagues to get engaged in kinds of discussions that has to do with women's rights and responsibilities and participations in the political domain, but they managed to have network of support outside of the parliament among the women lawyers, women journalists, women scholars. So it was a fantastic time for women to really express their views uh, um, of what was happening in Iran. I happened to be in Iran. I participated in a lot of these activities. Uh, I went to the gatherings. Uh, it, it, it's just incredible. I, you know, written about them. But what happened? What happened after that? And that's where the unequal political um, privilege and power comes in. After the sixth parliament, the entire women representatives who were in the parliament were disqualified. They could not continue to go on and um, continue their um, activities for their um, constituency or within the country for uh, within the parliament for the country and the women who came to power after that were those who were supported by particular ideological political powers and they really they did not um, have much voices um, they did not um, try to um, shall we say, a step beyond their uh, domain of responsibilities, which was assigned to them. Uh, they were cons uh, consistently prevented from uh, becoming the um, leaders of um, one caucus or another in the parliament. So, you know, I mean, the situation of women in the parliament uh, uh, declined. Um, so it is really important to see how these women have um, uh, try to, I mean, Iranian women, I, I think I lost the, 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 the major point of the question, but what I am trying to say is that uh, when women get a chance, as soon as they get a chance, they try to come in and be active and be vocal and be visible, but then there is a huge pushback that, um, so as soon as women have one step forward, they'll push two steps backward. Thank you. Another viewer asks, in the US, we're seeing Muslim women in political positions and as visible leaders of a progressive movement, for example, Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. Can you talk about their influence, if any, in the context of Muslim majority countries? Um, well, again, <laughs> this is not the area that I have worked on, but as a Muslim woman, as a woman, as a uh, um, hopefully a progressive woman in this country, I could not not you know, notice the presence of Ilhan Omar or Rashida Talib or other women, not on that level, but in other uh, arenas of uh, activities, scientific, scholarly, political, economic, what have you, they're Muslim women, they're Muslim women everywhere. So these two women, no doubt, are going to be very, very influential and not just for a Muslim woman, I hope, uh, I hope that they have greater appeals to their constituency who they happen to be of whatever background, Jewish, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, you know, Hindu and what have you. Uh, but we also have to realize that there is tremendous, tremendous uh, um, pressure to push these women out of the political arena and a lot of money is raised to push them out. But they are fighting and and they are very articulate. I have seen Ilhan Omar in the Congress uh, in some of the caucuses. Um, she is very articulate, she's very interesting. But I hope they keep their uh, agendas in uh, perspective and not to be um, pushed one way or another by some interest groups this way or that way. So as far as their visibility and their impact on Muslim women in the country or other women. I just don't think that we have to 
necessarily think just because I'm Muslim, I have to have influence only on Muslim women. Uh, the same way that many of my professors happen to be from other faith or other backgrounds, and they had strong influence on me and many other people. So I hope these two women and many more like them, and I hope to get involved in politics would have lasting and positive and productive uh, impact on their constituencies uh, uh, initially and then on the entire country eventually. Thank you. I want to combine two questions. So one viewer says, many thanks for your pioneering and cross-cultural work on women. I have learned a great deal from your body of work. Would you tell us who is your favorite queen and why? And then another viewer says, why have you not included any Iranian women leaders as one of the unforgettable queens in your book? You know, it is so hard to say which one is my favorite queen, but I am going to um, risk and say the Queen of Sheba, uh, who is really extraordinary. Um, and uh, I have written several papers about her. I mean, her character, um, we have just a few lines, you know, in the Quran, the story is, you know, part of Surah of um, Nam, Surah 27 and Ayah from 20 to 45. There's a very short number of um, ayahs, verses about her, but then her impact in the imaginations of the Muslims and Jews and Christians and Ethiopians and others has been international and cross-cultural and, you know, on and on. So she's very um, special, but of course other women are um, of interest to me. I, I found um, almost all of them really, uh, if one reads their life stories and that's what was my interest. The whole idea was how did this woman get to the position of power? How did they overcome all the obstacles to them, that is for women, in order to become uh, the queens? All of them are very charismatic. All of them are very aware of what's going on. And all of them have uh, tremendous public support. They create fear in the parts of the political and religious elites who try to push them out of power and eventually vanquish them. Someone like Abina Zibuto was basically killed and assassinated. So let me just not choose a particular um, a woman, a queen, all of them. I hope they're interest uh, to others. I desperately wanted to have a queen from Iran. And there are several queens. Um, there are, of course, Purandot, which I have written about her in my book, but uh, it was not a Muslim queen. Again, remember, I was trying to um, challenge some of the assumptions uh, that are prevalent here against Muslim women and Muslim women's political agency, political participations, their voices, their visibilities, all that. So part of my interlocutors are people from here. So for that matter, I wanted to really talk about these um, women who've actually come to power. Now, uh, I didn't want to write a survey book. I didn't want to include, there are many more. I would have liked to have one from Africa. Um, and, and particularly, as I said, I would have liked to have one from Iran. Um, Iranian women, as again, to go back to Professor Milani's uh, um, question, um, there are certain periods in Iranian histories where they have been tremendously powerful, tremendously influential and active in politics, but not necessarily, again, as uh, uh, the, the one who wears the crown. Uh, the Ilkhanian in, in, in Iran, you know, in the 13th and uh, 14th century became very powerful and women uh, in that, uh, from that uh, background uh, maintained huge power. There is a queen called Abish Khatun, which I was hoping to find more uh, information on her. She became actually a ruler in Shiraz, but um, very young, uh, but she got caught in some kind of um, subversive activities apparently, and she was eventually uh, jailed and killed when she was only 26 years old. So she, there is something about her, but uh, I could not find enough information here in the US and I was not able to go back to Iran and do that. So one of these days, I'm hoping to find more about her. But of course, we've had other queens throughout history who were queen concerts, not necessarily queen on their own rights. So that's why I couldn't have much on Iran. Thank you. I want to ask two more questions, which might take us one or two minutes over. But the first one is, how did the writing of this book change your views on the increasingly significant and topical issue of women in power in the world, and particularly in Iran? 
significantly, <laughs> it, it affected me significantly. But as I said, you know, the impetus was, um, well, as I mentioned in my book, um, I, as a young kid, um, was taken to um, some political uh, demonstrations by my father, who was a member of the National Front, Jeff Heimer Lee, but also my extended family, my paternal you know, extended family, there are very many women who are quite powerful, who have their PhDs, you know, who have, uh, who have traveled to Europe. My grandmother, my paternal grandmother, the wife of an Ayatollah was very powerful in our midst. And um, I have to tell you that she was the only wife of my grandfather. So he never married other women. So these, um, you know, I mean, um, things like that are accumulative. And at some point in your life, they sort of gel and then they become to fruition. So for me, it was a long process in personally and also intellectually. As I mentioned, I met these women um, uh, in who nominated themselves for presidential election in Iran. I met very powerful women in Pakistan. I was quite impressed by uh, Dina Zibuto. I happened to be in Pakistan when she was first elected and I had never seen anything like it, you know, like the a number of men dancing in front of her motorcade, the amount of red roses thrown on her uh, uh, path. And she couldn't even, uh, the, the motorcade couldn't even move. It was just incredible. I mean, there was an envy of, I don't know, 1,000 politicians. So uh, all these gradually built up. And again, you know, being as, I mean, uh, Hillary Clinton here, Mrs. Hillary Clinton becoming a nominee for her political party. So all that contributed to uh, finally, you know, jelling the idea, although I had the idea, I pro made my proposal before Hillary Clinton became uh, the nominee of her party, but all of that are important. And again, you know, going to Iran and meeting a lot of interesting women, a lot of active women, a lot of, uh, you know, awfully uh, engaged women in Iran, then I thought, excuse me, that would be a good time to write about that topic. And as I said, I also wanted to be something more cross-cultural, not just uh, limited to a particular um, country, as much as I would have liked to write something about my own country. Thank you. Okay, last question. How hopeful or optimistic are you that the Iranian women's movement will be able to advance its goals? I wish I had the crystal ball. Uh, but um, if, give, given what has happened, you know, like trying to uh, uh, divine um, the future based on what has happened uh, in the past, uh, I am pretty hopeful. I am pretty hopeful, but by the same token, I think the push to um, the backlash to push them back is also going to be fierce. What is good is to see that many men, young men, older men, fathers, brothers, are becoming aware of the tremendous injustices that has gone on to women. And they are supportive of their um, daughters, wives, um, children, uh, mothers, all that. So I am hoping that uh, with these uh, women making common cause with um, some political elites, maybe even some uh, reformist, uh, open-minded, religious release. Let me tell you, my grandfather, who was an Ayatollah, was very open-minded. Not We never veiled before him. Uh, many of my cousins or my aunts left, went to Europe. They were educated in Europe at the time when not very many women did so. So there are uh, uh, open-minded, educated Ayatollahs who are supportive of their daughter's uh, educations, their daughter's ambitions. So I'm hoping that, you know, that there is a common ground made by women, men, political elite for the betterment of the country. Because when we have a good constitution, when we have good laws, uh, the society flourishes even more than it has had. I mean, there's something really vital about the Iranian uh, society. I mean, there's the vitality, the creativity that we have seen it even in this past 40 years, the films, the plays, the music, all that, you name it, this, uh, paintings, visuals, it's just incredible what people have done despite the restrictions uh, that was placed on them by the state. Nonetheless, I think um, there is hope for that. 
and I am hopeful. Thank you so much, Dr. Hayri. I want to pass along comments from many of our viewers who are thanking you for your work and for a wonderful talk. And I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of the questions, but thank you to everyone who stayed on a few minutes late. And again, Dr. Hayri, thank you for a wonderful talk. And hopefully we can host you at Stanford in person. I hope so too. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Milani. Thank you, Franco. Thank you, Ms. Bahad. I really enjoyed these conversations. I look forward to continuing them. Thank you. Us as well. Mm, thank you. Bye.